So today um, we're joined by Dr. Megan Gokian to talk about the psychology of climate change. Uh, Megan is core faculty in environmental studies at Antioch University, New England. She is a behavioral scientist whose work examines how social, psychological, and contextual factors interact to influence individual and collective environmental decision-making. She uses a variety of methodological techniques and theor theoretical approaches to answer research questions examining how, for instance, so social psychological mechanisms and processes interact with people's decision-making environments to shape behavior across issues of con conservation and sustainability. So welcome, Megan, and I will um, pass the screen over to you. Great. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you, Justine, for that welcome. So hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen here and just confirm that everyone can see that, I hope. Yes. All right. That's great. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Megan. I'm a behavioral scientist. So that means I think a lot about kind of why people do the things that they do, particularly when it comes to climate change and other environmental issues. Um, so I'm gonna talk today a little bit about how we as people really perceive and respond to environmental risks. So environmental risks, just like climate change. And then I'll kind of sum up talking a little bit about what general strategies we can use when we communicate about this issues and what strategies are the most kind of effective. So some top lines to finish off with. So to start, there's a lot of information out there right now highlighting one, that scientifically climate change is happening. I think everyone in this room knows that, um, that experts overwhelmingly agree that it's happening and that it's us. And to some surprise for you is actually that most Americans agree that it's happening, they're concerned about it, and they are motivated to take action, which really kind of raises this question of why haven't we seen this groundswell of support um, to address this issue across different scales. And sometimes the resounding or most common response that we get is we've had this failure of communication. And with that said, for a long time, practitioners, scientists, professionals like yourselves took this to mean that people just didn't know and they didn't understand the science. And so they assume that this lack in factual understanding was this really significant barrier to issue engagement. But what we know today is that throwing more and more facts about the problem at people is extremely unlikely to shift their minds and it's extremely unlikely to shift their hearts in any appreciable way. And I'm not saying knowledge isn't unimportant, but alone really doesn't tend to drive action or drive behavior in any domain that we're talking about. So we've had this really significant need to develop more effective ways that incorporate what we know about the characteristics of the issue. So what do we know about climate change itself? in addition to how those characteristics interact with the way people understand and process information generally. So thinking about psychology, cognition, and different social systems and social structures that we use to process things. So what is it about climate change that makes it so incredibly difficult to talk about? And there's a lot of reasons here. The first is just dealing with the biophysical nature of the issue. It's slow moving, has really long time horizons. We're dealing with gradual changes across hundreds and hundreds of years. It's also the scale, it's massive in scale. And we're thinking about an intergenerational and it's also international and global in scope. And so it's an intergenerational threat and international threat, which are types of threats that we don't necessarily engage with um, in our everyday lives. It's also incredibly complex, right? There's many contributing factors and actors that in, have influenced this issue across time. And provided most people don't, or most people fundamentally lack an understanding of how to discern the science, we really need to rely on expert analysis, which starts to think about who trusts experts and et cetera, which is a massive issue today. It's also incredibly abstract. Unfortunately, and somewhat fortunately, has really invisible causes. We can't see greenhouse gases accumulating in the atmosphere. 
And it's also abstract in the sense that it has really diffuse impacts, right? It's occurring over there, over here, here, right? It's, again, it's international in scope. The second issue, and I think everyone has a pretty visceral grasp of this, is the significant cultural conflict and political polarization that exists around climate change. This issue has become less about the science and more about what this means for disparate groups that operate within society. And partisanship around climate change really started in the 80s and early 90s in the United States. But this gap has continued to widen to this day and, and rather significantly, right? In this graphic here, it shows that Democrats are more than three times as likely as Republicans to say that dealing with climate change should be a top priority um, for the United States government. And what this really means to say is that we're dealing with very diffuse and very diverse audiences who are differentially motivated by their own interests and their own values, which I'll touch on later. Another thing is that climate change really lacks those in your face characteristics and it lacks issue salience generally. And for people, our attention, and I think everyone can feel this these days as we're navigating Zoom regularly, our attention is a finite resource, right? It suggests that we have a limited pool of worry. And certainly in the era of COVID, there are a number of social issue issues and threats and risks and concerns that occupy our minds to a greater degree than climate change at any given time. And you can see on this Pew report that climate change comparatively to these other issues like strengthening the economy or COVID really does fall to the bottom. So let's look at how some of these kind of general broad sweeping characteristics are really interact with and are amplified by different social psychological factors that we use to process and understand information as people, as humans. So the first thing to really touch on here is cognition, right? And cognition is essentially our perceptions and what we use to perceive and process information. And as humans, our brain is powerful at kind of what makes us and where we derive our strength. But our brain is also really limited in terms of how we process different stimuli that we're presented with. And for the most part, as people and as humans, we were built to deal with immediate threats that are presented to us, right? I think everyone knows the stimulus response mechanisms that we're neurologically wired to respond and have that fight or flight response. But climate change really isn't easily detected by personal experience. You know, climate change actually refers to systematic changes in average conditions over centuries and decades. And so observations are space and time. And to that end, our memory of past events can be really faulty. The other thing is that we are somewhat terrible about thinking about the future. If I were to ask everyone in this room, what's your five-year plan? Many of you would be able to say with some certainty or with some um, clarity what you're thinking about within the next five years. If I were to ask you what your 30-year plan was, for a lot of you, the only thing you might be able to come up with is the mortgage payments that you have, which usually operates on that 30 year basis. And when it comes to adaptation, when it comes to other even mitigating behaviors, we're asking people to take action now, but the likelihood that they're personally gonna experience those benefits is incredibly low. And so that delayed benefit of action, really cognitively it disrupts our ability to detect change um, because those feedback loops are so disruptive. And since we discount future events, adaptation in particular and getting people to join on to those behaviors can be really difficult. And so since many people are not equipped to understand the science, nor do we or can we expect them to actually invest the time and energy and resources to do so, they rely on personal experience. But experience, as I just noted, is really faulty and driven by a lot of cognitive biases or heuristics in terms of how we understand and process information uh, about the issue. And since the problem isn't immediate and in our face, these heuristics and biases can become convoluted quite quickly. So for example, I'm just gonna highlight three different cognitive biases that tend to rear its head in the context of climate change and adaptation in particular. And the first is the sunk cost fallacy. When we as people 
put all our eggs in the basket and we're following this basket, but we start to notice that it has issues, it has problems, we hold on to that basket because we've invested resources into it, right? And so we stay that course, even though it's going down with a sinking ship. Another issue that kind of raises its head is the availability heuristic or bias. And that's the tendency for us to see recent events as more salient, which actually can really strongly disrupt our ability to detect and think about climate change as an issue. For instance, there's research that shows that after periods of really unusual warmth, people tend to be more convinced and more concerned about global warming. Conversely, after really cold periods, we see the exact opposite, right? People are less convinced and less worried about climate change. And those are just really subtle day-to-day -day variations in weather, not climate. The last is the optimism bias, which seems odd that we'd say that people are generally optimistic. But when there's uncertainty about future outcomes, which there's a lot of uncertainty um, around climate change, that actually increases people's self-oriented behavior. And it's been shown to create more optimistic moral thinking. So we tend to overestimate the odds of our success, even though we haven't invested any resources to secure the likelihood of that success. And why this is an issue is because all these different cognitive biases can really influence or impede our ability to detect or perceive climate change as an actual threat. It can downplay the severity of climate change as a threat. It can also really prob problematically promote wait and see approaches where people kind of take over the mindset that, huh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, even though I'm not actively engaging in anything out of the gate. Another issue that we see is that climate change is really psychologically distant. And psychological distance is kind of the cognitive separation between the self and other instances. And that other instance can be a person, it can be an event, it can be a time. And we see this um, geographically. So here versus there, socially, me versus someone else, temporally um, across time and hypothetically and how we're able to conceive and process different events. And we see this in the context of climate change and adaptation and mitigation quite regularly. So this is a study I engaged in recently with colleagues. And we surveyed people in both Massachusetts and Colorado who owned some forested land on their property. And we asked them the likelihood that they may experience either wild, wildfire on their property in Colorado or invasive pests in Massachusetts. And we, we asked this across two different psychological distant dimensions, right? On my own property versus someone else. So it kind of has that social um, element and also temporally likelihood of the experiencing within this year or in the next five years. And what we see is people start to push the reality or the likelihood of experiencing this risk away from themselves, both in terms of socially, right? It's a little bit more likely on my neighbor's property and also temporally it's more likely that I'll experience this within five years. So you start to see how people start to push these risks away, which can decrease their severity, um, their perceptions of the severity and their perceptions of whether it's happening or not. So even though we have all, you know, faulty cognitive and perceptual systems, in an ideal world, when we went to evaluate information we take it in, evaluate it, and we'd update our beliefs accordingly, right? We take in more data, we take in more scientific information, and that should be our guide. That is certainly not the case of what we experience in our reality today. And what we do more often than not is we engage in really biased information search and really biased information assimilation. And this is where we start to see how polarize different societal risk and physical risk are perceived in today's society, particularly in the United States. I source my information from here, you source your information from here. And we do that so it aligns with our underlying beliefs to date. And so what's, what's driving this bias search and assimilation? And this is really where these social um, factors start to rear their head quite significantly in the context of climate change. And the first is thinking about how values shape climate engagement. 
So different people have vastly different understandings, responses to, and conclusions about climate change, in part because they hold different core values. And core values or values are basically what people care about, right? You can value creativity, you can value power, you can value benevolence or security. And these values really help people make judgments about whether or not climate change is a problem, whether it's important and how they should act or respond to it. So you can start to see why someone who, you know, strongly values power or tradition or prosperity may be pretty antagonistic to common narratives around climate change, suggesting this need for physical or social change or this need for sacrifice and reduced material consumption. And so if climate change and the information about it contradicts those person's values, they're not going to be moved to action. Another area we talk about in this context is worldviews. And worldviews are kind of deeply held beliefs about how people think the world works and how they think society should be organized and structured. And so one relevant worldview that we talk about is displayed here on this axis. And the y-axis hierarchy to egalitarianism is really looking at differences between how people think the rights, duties, and goods should be distributed within society. Hierarchical thinks that um, it should be distributed across clearly fine social characteristics like gender and wealth and lineage and ethnicity. Egalitarians think it should be equally distributed without regard to those characteristics. And the second worldview that comes to mind here is individualism and communitarianism, where individualistic people think that individuals are responsible for their own flourishing and securing the conditions of their own flourishing. And on the other side, the communitarianism thinks that the societal interests should be and take precedence over individual ones and that society should bear the responsibility for helping individuals flourish. And so I imagine you can start to think about who is more or less likely to support um, climate change or perceive it as a risk. And what we see is that in the upper left-hand corner, these people are less likely to be supportive of action about climate change, especially when a government run policy or solution is highlighted. There's that really strong reactance to that interference. Conversely, people in the right-hand corner tend to perceive climate change that affects poorer populations, which it does, or minorities, which it does, um, and that will lead to even greater inequality, which moves them to be way more supportive about taking action on climate change. And why I mentioned worldviews and values and in a minute identity is because all these things are wrapped up in our political ideology and our political identity these days. And so the last thing to highlight here is noting how identity shapes climate engagement. And identity is really a person's conception or expression or his or herself and the social groups that he or she is a part of. And we possess multiple identities, right? Gender, sexual orientation, um, member of a religious group, parent, political party. And what's important about identity is that they hold certain norms, right? There's norms associated with them. There's responsibilities associated with them. And those can provide cues about how we act in a certain situation. And for some people, engaging in a behavior or making a belief public can really serve as a way to signal to others your membership to a group. And in the context of climate change, strongly held identities can also be really influential when we have a limited understanding of a topic. And so instead of trying to understand and ascertain what's going on, we just simply start to rely on what those identities mean and represent and express our understanding of an issue through our identity and less on understanding. And I can show you just how this operates. So this was a really seminal study by Kahan and others. And what they looked at was they gave an assessment of ordinary science intelligence, which was basically asking questions about how people are how intelligent people are about basic scientific facts, like true or false, electrons are smaller than atoms, right? And so they put that on a scale, low percentile to the highest percentile. And then they wanted to see, you know, as your ordinary science intelligence increases, does that increase or decrease the likelihood that you'll answer a question like this correct? 
right? There's solid evidence of recent global warming due mostly to human activity. And this is the relationship we'd expect to see. As you're more intelligent about basic scientific facts, your likelihood of answering that question would increase. But when you overlay political identity onto this, the really, really interesting and a really problematic and discouraging result occurs. And we start to see a really significant separation here. And this, these findings, so you see that liberals, liberal Democrats have that same kind of um, positive correlation. We actually seek to see a, a negative correlation occur as conservative Republicans become more knowledge about ordinary science intelligence, they start to actually refute or disagree with this statement to a greater degree. And what Kahan's findings really show, um, it, it can really be viewed as evidence of how remarkably well-equipped ordinary individuals are to discern which stances towards scientific information or scientific issues or environmental risk secure their personal and group interests in those that do not, right? So they start to push these issues away because they understand that dealing with them may present challenges to other things that they represent. And so while I highlighted some things about the cognitive issues and perceptions about climate change, it's really important to understand that climate perceptions are, have become incredibly socially entrenched. And what is mostly driving people's understanding and belief in it is their political ideology and their cultural cognition around it. And so this has a really strong influence when it comes to communication because people selectively credit and dismiss information in a manner that reinforces those underlying beliefs. And it also influences how they evaluate and intend to expert opinions. So this really raises the question, how do you communicate about an issue that possesses all these characteristics we just noted, right? Uncertainty, it's abstract, it's politically divisive. Then you also lay on top an issue like adaptation. I'm not sure if that, there we go. Um, it's generally a novel term, it's a novel concept and somewhat unfamiliar to most of the population. It also may be viewed as a means of copying out and fighting mitigation, right? Are we giving in and conceding to defeat? And while yes, it's awesome that it brings um, climate change home and makes it more personally relevant, it also increases the salience of the local costs associated with it, right? And again, we're dealing with local, um, asking people to do something now, but having really delayed benefits. So I really quickly wanna highlight kind of Knowing what we know about how people understand and process climate change, how can we more effectively communicate about it? And if you were to go to any talk like this or read any information packet about climate change communication, it'll always say something about know your audience, start where your audience is at and know something about them. And what that means is basically we need to package and frame information about climate adaptation in a way that makes it more easily digestible. And that means tying into people's needs, their values, their beliefs, and their identities in whatever context you're operating within. And somewhat unfortunately and fortunately, everyone cares about something and climate change touches almost every aspect of life. So finding those connections, right? If someone strongly values work and self-sufficiency, they may be more receptive to um, messages about adaptation when speaking to how changes may strengthen their community preparedness for future natural disasters or threats. It also means maybe just simply avoiding the term climate change, right? In certain contexts and situations, mentioning climate change can really inappropriately politicize the situation and you could immediately um, lose the engagement with that audience or that community. And also restructuring how we talk about adaptation generally, which I imagine many of you do, right? Preparation, preparedness, readiness, adjustments, planning, coping, resilience are all great words to use. Another thing is to connect to the science to the local level. Adaptation obviously is very much a local and regional decision, but at times when we talk about the issue at hand, when we talk about climate change or global warming, we're talking about it at a scale that's disconnected from the decision makers that we're engaging with. Um, so in bringing this issue home, we really need to bring the science home, 
Thus, if you have the opportunity to work with scientists that have downscale data sets, right, we're taking information known at large scales to make predictions at local scales can really help amplify and encourage issue engagement. We somewhat highlighted this earlier, but it's really critical to use and work with, excuse me, trusted, connected in-group messengers. While the message, you know, how we package that information is critically important, who the message is coming from is sometimes even more critical given what we know about the social implications of engagement. So working, identifying, working with, and building trust with local um, in-group messengers or organizations or people that have strong connections within the community um, can really help get your message out and more so that it's actually attended to in the first place. Another thing is to address uncertainty. Climate science is bound with uncertainty. That is science generally that has a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, and as people though, we need, we have this great need for predictability um, and uncertainty can be really, really uncomfortable for us as people. And so we wanna make people or make it known what aspects of this issue we know with a really um, high degree of confidence and what may still be poorly understood. And, it, and certainly in this context too, it's not necessarily about the if, but more about communicating the uncertainty of the when. So final slide here, a few more notes. Another thing is to engage emotions, right? Adaptation can be less about the technicalities and more about the effective or emotional dimensions of coming to terms with and coping with change and accepting reality, right? Accepting grief and understanding grief and the loss of place potentially, um, which is something called solastalgia. Um, and engaging with any risk generally, be it climate change or any risk, is never merely a cognitive process. It's not fundamentally about knowledge and understanding, but more so fundamentally about the emotions that are associated with it. And there's a lot of talk about too much focus on the doom, we need more positive. What we should be doing is engaging the full suite of emotions, right? There is the reality that we're facing that is climate change. It is dark, it is scary, but we also need to embed some constructive hope in people to produce those changes and get on board. And in terms of emotions too, we really need to think critically about engaging place attachment and identity meaningfully and not threatening, right? We want people to engage in place protective behaviors in response to the threat of climate change and not, into, and not engage in place protective um, behaviors in response to the messages or the changes that you're promoting, right? And there's a, a little a nuance there, right? You wanna avoid issues where nimbyism or not in my backyard or people doing anything to preserve, preserve, preserve. Um, but if we engage emotions and understand the grief and social, emotional and physical bonds that people have with place, we're better able to meet them where they're at and do it in a more valid and also an authentic way, right? To meet people where they are. The second to last thing is to really tell stories, right? Stories are ubiquitous to the human experience and really correspond with the way that we learn and the way that we connect with and take in information. It is how we learned everything as children. It's how we learned about right and wrong and different morals that exist. And why stories are powerful is because they produce relatable characters, right? Someone that we can attend to and relate to. And they also structure information in a way that presents a problem and then there's a resolution associated with it. And I think everyone can feel the tension when you see or watch a movie and it ends on a wide open note. I often feel cheated. And that's why there's no resolution. And we really are grappling and, and looking for that resolution. Um, so if there's examples of adaptation related to your work in other contexts, share those stories of success. And finally, and related to that is to focus on solutions. We have a very strong tendency when we talk about climate change to say, this is the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem. And then we spend you know, 30, 40 seconds on, well, here's what you can do about it, right? Oftentimes we should be leading with the solutions to bring people in because leading with solutions helps people feel efficacious, right? In order to engage in a behavior, 
We need to feel like we're capable of doing it as people, but we also need to feel like that behavior is going to result in a desired outcome. And the last is to leverage visuals, right? We're dealing with a future that is not yet pre present and asking people to envision a future that they can't see. So how can we do that tangibly? You know, using and leveraging photographs from places like climatevisuals.org, data visualizations, or landscape visualizations, all of which I imagine many of you operate in the context of producing strong visuals. So with that said, I'd say be very mindful of the cognitive processes that shape how we process and understand risks, but have a really attentive focus to how socially entrenched climate change is and how communicating about it is socially entrenched as well. And I will say lead with meeting people where they're at. Hand it back over to Justine for breakout rooms. <laughs>